Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Garage Church 2020. I'm John. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, just use me today to speak whatever it is that you would have me speak, Lord. And please let those words reach the ears that need to hear them, Lord. Uh, just let me be a light in this world and uh, just lift up my brothers and my friends to you right now and just ask that uh, you also use them in mighty ways. And we pray that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are in week three of our new series, and that series is entitled, What Incarnation Teaches Us. And if you haven't joined us over the last couple of weeks, we've defined incarnation as the central Christian doctrine that God became flesh, that God assumes human nature, and became a man in the form of Jesus Christ. The Son of God and the second person of the Trinity, Christ was truly God and truly human. Now, this week's title and topic is Incarnation Teaches Us That God Has an Eternal Plan. And that eternal plan is for us to return to him in trust through the sacrificial act of the cross and dwell in his house forever. Uh, the first argument of many atheists is that we as humans invented gods so that we would not have to face the reality of eternity. And if you think about it, the reality of, uh, of eternity is pretty frightening. You know, um, we're here today, we're alive, you know, we have a, um, an ability that no other animal has, and that's self-awareness. We're aware of ourselves, we're aware of our lives, and uh, all of the things that that entails. And the, the vastness of eternity is pretty intimidating. An eternity of nothing seems even worse, almost unbearable, as compared to maybe an eternity uh, with God himself. Um, and I think about it like this. We're alive, and we're alive for a short amount of time, and then nothing? Nothing forever? It's, uh, it's pretty scary. Even worse, you know, an eternity uh, cut off from God, an eternity in hell. Uh, there's some pretty graphic language that describes that eternity in hell. Uh, although I don't know anybody that's been there and returned, so we really don't know what that looks like. I think the language that was used um, is the only language that can bring to us just how intense that eternity can be. Um, I use the example from my own life where there's been times in my life where I've been so low and uh, felt so far from God that the intensity was like the burning, you know, the, 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 uh, the burning sensation that they talk about the lake of fire. Um, to, to be so far down in life where you, um, you don't even want to live anymore. And the, Unless you've been there, it's really hard to describe, but the intensity is very real. The intensity, the only way to describe it is if you've ever been burned, and I have. I had third-degree burns on this hand right here. I actually burned all the flesh off between my fingers. It actually looks pretty amazing, um, but uh, I went through the whole process. I had to go in and get, get the skin peeled off a couple times, and uh, the intensity is just unbelievable. Uh, I remember being in pain for days and days and days. It just never stopped. It just never let up. Um, anyway, uh, life is short. Life goes by so quick. I just turned 60 a week ago, and I got to be honest with you, uh, a lot of what I feel is, wow, where did 60 years go? It's just like, boom, you know, here I am. I'm 60 years old. Uh, you know, my wife, you know, my wife asks me all the time. She's like, what are you, 12? Because I do. <laughs> I, have, I have like a childish sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to get into details, but I have a childish sense of humor. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, even though my body feels 60 in my heart and in my spirit, I'm still a young man. You know, I have a lot of I have a lot of life left in me. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I enjoy life. Uh, I can't say I always did, but I enjoy life. And, uh, uh, you know, 
for instance, you know, the motorcycles, you know, I ride, I ride my motorcycle like a teenager, you know, I, I'm all about going out there and ripping and tearing. Anyway, uh, time flies, but I remember when I was a kid and, you know, a lot of people can relate, maybe Brian here can relate to this, uh, on summer vacation. And now for me, summer vacation, you know, this was back before, 100 channels of TV or 200 channels of TV, video games. We were outside. We played all the time. We rode our bicycles. We played baseball. We uh, we built tree houses and all that stuff. And all of this stuff we had to do, we still ended up getting bored. And on those days where we were bored, they just dragged. It's like time stopped. And it just seemed like an eternity. We'd be we'd be whining to mom and dad. We're bored. We want something to do. Can we go swimming? Can we can we do something? You know, we were bored. We were looking for another experience. Um, and those days those days do drag on. And there's other days that drag on too. And uh, uh, I can share from personal experience. There's been a point in my life in my addiction when I was actively using. Uh, where I just despaired of life. I did not want to live anymore. As a matter of fact, I asked God on several occasions to end my life. Just let me leave this world. I don't want to be here anymore. And those days drag on. When you are in hell, when you are in a self-imposed hell, your time stops and it drags on forever and it just never seems to like it's going to end. And those, inf those feelings are very intense. And, you know, that takes us back to that, uh, you know, language, that, that graphic language of just how intense those feelings can be. Even Paul, one of the most fruitful apostles and a major contributor to the New's New Testament, said this of his travels in Asia. In 2 Corinthians 1.8, uh, we do not want you to be in, uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. And he was talking about a rough period of time in his life where he was just like, why am I doing this? What, you know, what's the point? And, uh, you know, Paul's an amazing character. I've had the, uh, the blessing and the opportunity to stu study a lot about his life. And Paul actually... Uh, was taken up to heaven by Jesus. And there's a lot there's a lot that goes into that, and you've got to do a lot of digging and studying to understand everything that he witnessed. But before his experience in Asia, Jesus blessed Paul with an opportunity to see what was waiting for him after this life. <clears throat> uh, so those who despair of life itself most often hang on for the fear of the unknown and the finality of death. Uh, and I can say that about myself, you know, at the lowest point in my life where I didn't want to live anymore, my belief in God and my uncertainty about eternity and where I was going kept me from ending myself. Um, you know, some misinterpretations about God's true nature and what God was like. Uh, you know, I had a lot of doubt about, uh, who I was, who God was, and where I was going after I left this world. Now, I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to say that if you're in a place in your life where you feel like giving up, and you're thinking about harming yourself or killing yourself, seek help. Please seek help. Uh, way too often people give up before the miracle happens. You know, uh, in recovery, we've always said, don't give up, you know, a, a minute before the miracle happens. And it's true. Uh, we all have bad periods in life, but we also have good periods, and um, good will come to you. Uh, if you can't find help, reach out to us. Message me here on Facebook, and I'll find you some help. Uh, there's a popular meme on Facebook that says, I'd rather sit with you and listen to your problems than go to your funeral. And I'm all about that. I would much rather sit in there, listen to you whine and complain about your problems uh, than go to your funeral. Now, I know many people have listened to me whine and complain about my problems. I was just sitting here a few minutes ago whining to my brother Brian about what's going on. You know, I got a lot of pain issues, and I'm, I'm kind of struggling with uh, what's going on in my life right now. But I know God's got something better for me on the other side of this. And if I just hang in there, um, 
God's, God's going to show me something cool. He always has. Every time I've been in a bad situation, it's turned into something good on the other side. So anyway, we tend to view life from a finite perspective. And what I mean by this is we tend to think of here and now. You know, we only focus on this lifetime. Uh, we get hyper focused on this lifetime. I got to do this, that, and the other thing because I might not be here tomorrow. Uh, we we uh, we get all oh I gotta I gotta put away a million dollars for my retirement. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. I gotta do all of these things. And uh, the problem being is you know we think we've got an idea of what uh, what the future holds for us. You know we might step out in front of a bus tomorrow and get squashed. Uh, me and my brother here sitting here right now. We both had some pretty. Uh, Pretty amazing wrecks that we shouldn't have even walked away from. I mean, Brian's wreck was uh, it's just like, wow. I mean, mine was bad, but, you know, when I see and hear what happened to Brian and he's still here, it's like, <laughs> God's got a plan for him. Amen? Amen to that, brother. <laughs> uh, anyway, the reality is, is that the stronger that belief is, the more we tend to live that way. That is that people, even professed Christians who, not, who do not view life from an eternal perspective, tend to spend their lives in the pursuit of instant gratification. And even worse, live in fear of eternity or lack thereof. Uh, they're afraid, you know, that, oh, I'm going to die and, you know, I haven't done everything I needed to do or that, you know, eternity is not real and there's nothing beyond this life. And that's just not the case. Uh, you know, you only live once mentality. Here's the problem with that kind of thinking. The world tells us that we have to be happy all the time, you know, because this is the only life we get, that we have to have all the trappings of this life. I got to have the best house. I got to have the best uh, car, the newest cell phone and all the trappings of this life. But the reality is chasing all these things that the world tells us we need. It's just a never ending hole that we're never going to fill. It's impossible. Trust me. I've been there. I've done that. Uh, Excuse me. When I first got clean, I got my self-worth in the money I was making and having all the things that life told me I was supposed to have. The house, the car, the vacations, all of it. And I chased all of it until I realized that I just traded my addiction to drugs to my addiction uh, for an addiction uh, of success and making money. So, you know, even worse is the more stuff we have, the more we have to worry about. And it's the truth. You know, I, for instance, I'm at a place in, in my life, I got a 30 year old van sitting in the driveway that I just love because I can park it in a parking lot. And yeah, you put a door ding in and it's gonna piss me off, but it ain't gonna piss me off nearly as much as that $50,000 pickup truck that I'm making a $600 a month payment on. You put a door ding in that and I'm gonna chase you down. <laughs> Not right. That's not right. You know, forgive seven times 77, but, you know, that's still, you know, how I would be. Uh, I love this. In the movie, The Fight Club, Tyler, Tyler Durden tells the narrator, Edward, Edward Norton, and it's kind of cool. Edward Norton is never given a name in the movie because actually he's Tyler Durden, but they call him the narrator. If you, if you look up and read about uh, the movie anyway, Tyler Durden said this, the stuff that we own ends up owning us. And there's never been a truer statement to come out of Hollywood than that. The stuff that we own is the stuff that owns ends up owning us. Uh, you know, look at it like this. We don't pay for our house, our cars, our motorcycles, or anything in our life with money, unless you're born to it. And, you know, unless you were born with that silver spoon. The majority of us, we pay for our stuff with our time. That's why it's called an hourly wage or an annual salary. And when you start looking at that, it's like, oof. you know, I'm paying for my car. I'm paying for my bike. I'm paying for my house with my time. Time that probably could have been spent somewhere better, like with my kids, in worship of my God, with my wife. Uh... And, you know, I mean, when I realized that, it it really kind of tore me up. You know, how much of my life I'd given away for stupid things that really don't mean much. Uh, this 30-year-old van I got out in the driveway takes me where I want to go 
almost as well <laughs> as that new $50,000 truck. It takes a little TLC to keep a 30 year old vehicle running. You know, you gotta, and fortunately for me, I'm a mechanic. And if there's a problem, I know how to fix it. You know, I wouldn't advise everybody to go out and buy a fixer upper unless you know how to do it. That's why you don't buy an old shovel head because if you can't work on it, you don't need it. You're just gonna end up paying somebody to fix it for you. Anyway, I'm not telling you that God doesn't want you to live, uh, I, I'm not telling you that God wants you to live in poverty and that we shouldn't have nice things, but I'm, what I'm telling you is we need to put things in their proper pers perspective. It'll suffice to say that our attitudes about the things that we have can be the difference between the things that we have being a blessing or a curse. Uh, you know, for instance, me and my brothers in my local chapter here, uh, you know, I belong to a Christian motorcycle club, but we still, <laughs> we act pretty wild sometimes. Uh, my brothers and I, we kind of have the addiction to power and speed. Uh, and when we get together, we talk about whose bike is better and whose bike is faster. And when we get together and ride, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not always uh, a good Christian witness and we'll leave it at that. Um, anyway, we have to reel each other in on a regular basis and say, it's just a bike. We have to remind each other, it's just a bike. And when we use that bike, uh, as an opportunity for our witness uh, that truly speaks to how we should regard everything in our lives, our house, our home, our cars. If we take everything that God gives us and uses it for a good Christian witness, then we are no longer slaves to those things, but those things are a blessing and we can use them to bless other people. Uh, right now I got a bunch of coats uh, that have been donated for a coat drive in the back of my van. You know, and I'm using that van, not not you know, not that a 30-year-old Dodge van is a showpiece, but I'm using that uh, to glorify God and uh, to to be a witness to to others. Uh, I I try to do the same thing with my bike. My bike, uh, all of our bikes. You know, my brother Brian can can testify to this. You know, a bike when you're like out in the middle of nowhere and you pull into a gas station starts conversations. And when those conversations are started, it gives us an opportunity to witness to people. And we've seen that firsthand, and, and we love that. And if we can keep in the, keep our material possessions in those uh, proper perspectives, then, you know, like I said, everything can be a blessing. So anyway, moving on, um, we were not meant to have that finite perspective. We were not meant to view life as just right here and now. We were, vent, we were meant to view uh, this particular portion of our life as just the beginning. Uh, in Genesis 3, 1 through 5, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. The serpent said, you will certainly not die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing, uh, knowing good and evil. Now think about that for a minute. Would the Lord have told us not to eat that fruit lest we die if we, were, if, if we weren't meant to live forever? More than that, we were meant to live in a close trusting personal relationship with God. We were actually in the garden with him and we didn't trust God and thought we could do everything our own way and we got ourselves kicked out. In Genesis 3, 8 through 9, then the man and his wife heard the sound of God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? We were meant to walk in the garden with God forever. We had direct access to him. We had a personal relationship with him. And the enemy showed us or lied to us and made us think that we couldn't trust God and that we had to hide from him. Sin and death entered this world through the first Adam, but it was taken away by the second Adam. And if you don't know what that means, the first Adam was the created man that God created. 
The second Adam was also the created man, Jesus, and uh, he walked among us. <clears throat> now, incarnation teaches us that Jesus came to show us just how much our Father loves us and that we could return to him in trust. Furthermore, he taught us and told us about eternity. In John 14, 1 through 4, in the message, don't let this rattle you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me, there is plenty of room for you in my father's home. If there weren't so, if, excuse me, if it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get a room ready, I'll come back and get you so that you can live where I live and you already know the road I'm taking. If you can believe in Jesus, then eternity has to go in hand with that. In John 3, 13 through 15, in the message, no one has ever gone into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert so that people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expecting, will gain a real life, eternal life. We hid from God in the garden because of shame. The enemy told us that we were naked. He exposed our sin nature. We hid because we no longer trusted God. We were told that we needed to be afraid from, afraid of him and that um, basically he was going to punish us, which he may, but that he didn't love us, that we had to hide from him. That's what the enemy brought into this world, this fear and mistrust of who God is and God's nature. Uh, he, the enemy made us look at God through our own eyes and our own perspective. God's love is unconditional and forever. And when we're hiding from God, that's our personal choice, but that's not what God would have us do. God would have us be open and honest about who we are, who we see, and what we uh what we need to work on, where we're falling short. Jesus came to show us how to have a relationship with our Father. The act of the cross makes absolutely no sense if you don't want to believe. The story of the second thief speaks volumes about salvation and the lengths the Lord is willing to go to so that we can return to him and trust. Uh, and this was, uh, the story of the second thief is in uh, the book of Luke. Uh, Luke is called the physician. And Luke went around and got all the eyewitness accounts that he could get. And he put it all into um, that particular book of the Bible. Uh, I really enjoyed when I was in school studying about Luke and how he brought us all of this information uh, one of the stories that had a very profound effect on how I view God uh, and my relationship with God was the story of the second thief. And it goes like this. In Luke 23, 39 through 43, in the message, one of the criminals hanging alongside cursed him. Some Messiah you are, save yourself, save us. But the other one, the other thief, shut him up. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And he said, don't worry, I will. Today you will join me in paradise. Now, when I listen to that. It doesn't speak to, you know, being... Uh, a Christian your whole life and doing everything right. That guy was hanging on the cross. The second thief was hanging on the cross for a reason. He was a criminal. He was being punished for his crimes and he knew it. And yet he recognized who Jesus was and he said, please remember me. And that's all it took. All it took was that second thief to recognize that he was deserving of the punishment he was getting and that Jesus was God in the flesh and that um, uh, he did not deserve what he was getting, that he was taking our punishment for us. 
uh, remember, you know, throughout all of this, uh, these, uh, uh, these sermons that uh, I've been uh, preaching throughout this, ser- uh, this sermon series, God, God, uh, Jesus is fully human and fully God. And we can't help be changed by the act of the cross if you really look at just how um, the lengths that God was willing to go to bring us back to a trusting relationship in him. How could you not trust somebody that was willing to die for you? Uh, I mean, you know, I put my life in my brother's hands all the time and I trust them, but none of them have actually died for me. And if they did, you know, you know, how could I not trust how much that person loved me? And that's what this whole thing is about. The act of the cross is so that we can trust just how much God loves us. In Mark 1, 14 through 15, in the English Standard Version, it says, Now after John was arrested, we're talking about John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And I see a lot of uh, religious spirits, Christians, uh, you know, talking and pointing fingers, saying, oh, you're preaching cheap grace or cheap pe- preaching cheap grace. And I don't necessarily uh, subscribe to cheap grace either. Uh, we do have to do some footwork. Uh, but that footwork, we overcomplicate. We put ourselves into this position you know, that they were in way back when Jesus came, you know, this religious hierarchy, this uh, religious spirit where, oh, well, look at my righteousness. No, you have no righteousness. My righteousness, my brother's righteousness, we profess as only in Christ. I have no righteousness of my own. I can't get through a day without screwing up. And, um, you know, it gets kind of... uh, gets kind of annoying. Christians seem to be our own worst enemy. You know, we're point, we're real quick to point a finger, but then we turn around and uh, like me and my brother were talking about right before church, you know, you, you see the person with the uh, uh, the Jesus sticker on their bumper, the first ones to road rage in traffic and flip people off. I'm guilty of that. My, my brother Mark, who's actually out in truck driving school today, is guilty of that. He's the first one to confess to it. Uh, Repentance is all throughout the Bible. I, I forget, I think it's probably uh, somewhere in the upper 300 times, 380, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, I used to know the exact count. It's not coming to me right now and it doesn't matter. The point is, is it's throughout the Bible. And the word uh, in the original text is metanoia. And it's called for throughout the Bible. And what it means is an absolute and unconditional surrender to God as sovereign. Though it includes sorrow and regret, it is more than that. In repenting, one makes a complete change of direction. And that change of direction starts with knowing that I'm a screw up and I'm going to screw up. And that I need God to rescue me because I cannot rescue myself. If any one of us could have fulfilled the law, we would have. And Jesus would not have had to come. He would have held up that person that could have fulfilled the law and said, okay, you have to follow this guy and you have to be like this guy in order for me to allow you into my kingdom. That's not the way this works. Now, if you truly appreciate how much God loves you and how messed up you are, then you're going to have a change of heart. And you're going to ask God to help you and say, all right, God, I got stuff I need to go get rid of. I need to let go of and I need to move on from so that I can be closer to you, so that I can show you the love and the appreciation that you deserve for rescuing me from myself and from the enemy. Now, if you haven't experienced that change of heart, then, you know, reach out to us. Uh, We'll find a way to talk to you, whether it be, uh, you know, a a Facebook live call, a phone call. If you're here local, we'll meet with you. Uh, But we don't want anybody walking around that doesn't, you know, know, understand and appreciate that. We're here for you. If you're struggling right now, you know, these lockdowns have been really hard on people. A lot of people uh, you know, have relapsed because of it. There's a lot of people that are very depressed, you know, about current situations in our world. 
uh, don't stay there. You know, reach out to us. We want to pray for you. Uh, we want to minister to you. We want to share that peace, strength, and hope that we get from our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're not perfect. None of us are perfect. We want to share with you what we're learning and therefore disciple as we were called to do. Jesus told us to make disciples, not followers. We're not here to make followers. We're here to make disciples. And on that note, we are looking for a building that we can start doing this out in a more comfortable setting. Uh, my garage is nice, but it's really hard to keep warm when it's cold out. And that's not the most comfortable place. So we are actually trying to find a building in the Hagerstown area. And uh, so if you get a minute, pray for us that we can find that building and uh, keep moving in forward in what we feel God's calling us to do. And that is disciple our brothers and sisters. So let's pray. Uh, Father God, just thank you for this uh, opportunity to serve you today, Lord. Uh, thank you for my brother's presence here and his support. Uh, Lord, just watch over each and every one of us as we go forward this week and let us be a light and a witness to those around us, Lord, knowing and professing that is because of you that we can be a light. And we pray that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Uh, like I said, if you have a need, reach out to us on Messenger and we'll do our best to get back to you right away. Thank you. God bless.